On the day she was attacked, Nina called 911 and the operator put her through to the RCMP. After questioning her and getting some details, the dispatcher told her that police officers would be there as soon as possible. And it wasn't long before two RCMP officers arrived. The first thing the officers did was to determine whether Nina needed immediate medical attention. Once they knew Nina did not need to go to the hospital, they began their investigation. One officer checked the rest of Nina's house to make sure it was safe, while the other officer began taking Nina's statement. The officer taking Nina's statement was very patient. She told Nina to try and describe everything she could remember about the attack. In the meantime, the other officer took photographs of Nina's injuries as well as the damage done in the house. When he was finished, the second officer left to visit Nina's neighbors. He needed to obtain statements from anyone who might have seen or heard what had happened. Nina was worried about retaliation. She said she was feeling anxious and afraid to be in the house in case her attacker returned. She said she felt unsafe. The officer discussed safety issues with Nina and told her about a transition house, a safe place where she could go until she was able to return home. The officer said she would arrange for a victim services worker to take Nina there. Nina was also nervous about what would happen once her attacker was arrested. The officer explained that although not every case was the same, nor would they follow the exact same procedures, certain procedures are standard for most cases. She also said that Nina's attacker would be arrested and informed of the reason for his arrest. Depending on circumstances, her attacker might be released, or he could be held in custody for a bail hearing. That afternoon, a victim services worker named Jenny arrived to take Nina to a transition house. Jenny told Nina she'd be able to stay there until it was safe for her to return home. Once they arrived at the transition house, Jenny and Nina were welcomed by a staff member. Because Jenny had already told Nina all about the transition home and the process involved, Nina knew what to expect once she got there. The staff member made notes regarding Nina's case and explained to her all the rules and regulations of the house. The transition house staff member showed Nina and Jenny some of the facilities. Afterward, she took them to the room where Nina would be staying. Jenny gave Nina some information to read and promised to see her soon. Nina tried to gather her thoughts. She knew she had done the right thing, but she was afraid that her family and friends would be ashamed once the community heard what had happened. A few days later, Nina was far more confident when she met with the RCMP officer again. The officer told her that the police had located and arrested her attacker. He had been released back into the community. One of the conditions of his bail was that he could not contact Nina, nor could he go to her home or place of work. Nina promised the officer that she would contact the police if he did any of those things. The officer reiterated to Nina that the information which had been gathered had been sent to Crown Counsel and that Crown would then make the decision whether or not to proceed with charges. She told Nina it was safe for her to return home in the meantime, but that she'd have to wait a little while longer to hear what would happen regarding the court process. The officer told Nina that if the case did indeed go to trial, Crown Counsel would issue a subpoena for Nina to appear in court, which the RCMP would then deliver to her. The officer also explained that Nina would have to contact Crown Counsel once she received the subpoena, at which time she'd likely have to set up a meeting with the prosecutor before the trial date, possibly still a lengthy wait. Nina would have to be very patient. Finally, the officer took some additional photos of Nina's injuries to add to her file. Jenny promised to bring Nina more helpful information. Several weeks passed and Nina received her subpoena. By that time, Nina had read all the information she received from Jenny and knew just what to expect. She contacted Crown Counsel to confirm a meeting and arranged for Jenny to go with her. On the morning of her meeting with Crown Counsel, 
Nina was feeling much better. She knew it was an important meeting, and she felt reassured when she met with the prosecutor. The prosecutor went over Nina's statement with her. He asked her some questions and made note of her answers. He listened carefully to what she had to say and told her what could happen once the case went to trial. He explained that there were several possibilities regarding the outcome. When the interview was complete, the prosecutor took Nina and Jenny for an orientation tour of the courthouse. Nina was reassured immensely. At first, she felt intimidated when she thought about the upcoming trial, but since her meeting with the prosecutor, Nina felt much better. By the time they were finished with the tour, Nina knew exactly what was going to happen when it was time for her to give her testimony. On the drive home, Nina and Jenny discussed the fact that it might be a long time before the case went to court. Nina said she understood all of the reasons why this could happen and that she intended to keep herself busy in the meantime. She knew she was in it for the long haul. The day of the trial arrived. Nina was up bright and early and drove to the city with Jenny. She knew she would probably have to wait quite a while for her case to come up, so she brought some magazines to keep her mind occupied. Once Nina and Jenny arrived at the courthouse, the first thing Nina did was to check in with Crown Counsel. Nina and Jenny then went to wait in a private room. This was so they wouldn't have to encounter the accused or any of his friends or family. They settled down for a long wait. Time seemed to drag, but finally, Nina's name was called. Nina entered the courtroom. She walked toward the witness stand and waited to be acknowledged. The court clerk asked her to state her name, which Nina also spelled out for the court. She was asked if she wished to swear an oath or affirm the truth. She chose to affirm the truth and did so with confidence. Nina then took the stand and gave her testimony. The prosecutor proceeded to ask her several questions about the night of her attack. From her meeting with the prosecutor, Nina knew the procedure that would be followed. She knew she had to tell her story as truthfully as she remembered it, directly to the judge. Nina knew she'd be questioned not only by the prosecutor, but also by the lawyer for the defense and by the judge. She knew that it was the judge who would ultimately weigh the evidence to make a judgment. All she needed to do was direct her answers to the judge. Nina listened carefully, replying truthfully to each question. She spoke respectfully, with clarity, and loud enough for the judge to hear her. She was nervous at times during her testimony, but she remembered to breathe deeply and listen carefully before replying to each question asked of her. Nina was aware that when the lawyer for the defense questioned her about certain details, it wasn't a direct attack on her. It was his job to test the truthfulness and accuracy of her account. She answered each of his questions truthfully. When Nina was done, the judge thanked her and told her she was free to go. Nina knew that whatever the outcome, she had told the truth and she was relieved that it was finally over. Nina had finally had her day in court. She realized that she did not feel afraid anymore and she was proud of herself because she knew how hard it had been. She was glad that she'd had the courage to go through with it and felt in her heart that it had all been worthwhile. Nina was happy to go home and get on with her life. Each day, someone suffers some form of abuse or trauma and does not report it or seek help. There are many reasons for this, but victims can be found in all corners of society and include women, men, children, and vulnerable youth. If you or someone you know is being victimized, know that help is available to everyone at any time. All it takes is the courage to reach out. You can contact your local RCMP or municipal police, your community health center, or a helpline. There are several secure, anonymous helplines which you can call for information or to report abuse. Please don't suffer in silence.
This video could not have been made possible without the help and participation of so many people, organizations, and agencies. We wish to thank everyone involved in the production of Witness. Thank you very much.